So welcome. This is Leadership and Management Skills for Values-Driven Farm Businesses. I am Taylor Mulia, and I work for the Kibir Coalition, and we are doing this series in partnership with Olivia Tinkani. So this is uh, the first webinar. <laughs> there she is. Uh, this is the first webinar of the Meat Business Fundamentals series. So if you have not heard of the Kibir Coalition, we are an organization or a nonprofit based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and through education, innovation, and collaboration, we work in coalition with ranchers, farmers, government agencies, uh, and land stewards to foster resilience on working lands. And the program that I work for in particular, and uh, we have some other uh, of my coworkers, Hayden and Luca are here. Now uh, we work for the new agrarian program, which is a uh, training program for the next generation of land stewards. So we have an eight month apprenticeship on working farms and ranches. Um, it's a program that I adore. And if you'd like more information, you can find that at kiveracoalition.org. So don't forget to join us for the rest of this series. Very excited about um, all the information we have put together. Our next webinar will be on April 24th called Processing uh, Primer for the Producer. Then we have strategies for starting a meat business on May 9th. And they're all at the same time. And um, I think they're all on Thursdays too. So kind of a convenient um, series. I'm gonna go over some Zoom basics because I know a lot of us are working on farms and ranches, don't spend um, all day on Zoom. So if you're joining us by phone, I'm not sure how many of you are, but you can always push star six to mute and unmute yourself. It's kind of weird, but it does in fact work. Uh, and if you do have uh, the Zoom app, or if you're on a computer or something where you have a camera, please turn your camera on for most of this webinar, especially for the breakout groups, kind of weird talking to somebody where you can't actually see their face. So if you wouldn't mind turning your camera on, we totally understand if you have to step away at some point and turn it off, but uh, great for our presenters to see your actual faces. And the chat is open this whole time. Uh, you can practice right now by saying hello, uh, sharing your name and your operation, maybe where you're from. And then this is another one too that um, I always forget about, but if you find your little box um, with your name, you can always click these three dots right here and find rename and uh, put your actual name. Sometimes our computer puts a weird name for us and it's hard to identify folks. So if you wanna put your actual name and your preferred pronouns, that'll be easier for us to, uh, um, to identify you. Okay, and then just some quick Zoom etiquette. Uh, just please keep yourself on mute for the large group presentations. Um, I think we're all pretty, um, pretty well versed in that by now. Uh, be aware that everyone can see your comments in the chat. So if you wouldn't say it to someone in person, please don't say it in the chat. If you have an issue of any kind, please message me. I'm the administrator for this webinar, so happy to help. And then please take care of yourself. If you want to get water, stretch, go to the bathroom, you can turn on and off your camera. Uh, we don't mind. It's Kind of a long one so um, just take care of yourself and a couple social agreements we just do this for all the kibera webinars please be present speak from your experience listen to learn give space commit to learning not debating persuading or criticizing and offer constructive criticism of ideas not individuals and please just avoid blame speculation inflammatory language and generalizing social groups i think you all are going to be great but just worth saying and then um, before I pass it off, I'll just do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, the land where I live, I'm calling in from present day Lyons, Colorado, and it's the ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and Sioux, or Ocheti Sakowin peoples. We recognize indigenous peoples as the original and longstanding stewards of this land. Their extensive knowledge and practice of agriculture and land management established the foundation of land stewardship here. We recognize that the land and the knowledge was forcibly taken and appropriated from indigenous peoples. As fellow stewards, we honor and respect the land and peoples who have cared for it since time immemorial, and we commit to continue uh, building partnerships with indigenous people. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand it off to Olivia. Thanks, Taylor. And hello to everyone. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then we can start with our introductions. Um, 
I deeply appreciate, oops, sorry, deeply appreciate y'all being here. And um, so this, to give you just a little bit of a background, this is uh, something that we also presented on at the Kavira conference. Um, and we're really thrilled to be here again today. And I'm especially thrilled to be able to do it again uh, with my colleague Jabs here. And so we'll just get going. Um, this is also something that um, it's a module of learning that continues to change with every audience that um, we give it to. So I'm looking forward to seeing how you all uh, participate in it, really. So my name is Olivia Tinkani. I guess I probably should have started with that. I'm an independent farm business educator and a consultant. And I work <clears throat> independently with farms and ranches, helping them on the backside of the business, all the things that y'all don't want to ever think about. But most of what I do is create curriculum and farmer training programming. And that's where my passion um, really lies. And this is absolutely my favorite thing to teach. So hopefully that will come across here today. Um, Chance, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure thing. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chance Weston. I'm a member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Uh, I reside here on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I'm the director of food sovereignty for a local nonprofit here, focusing on um, producer development, um, food systems, uh, scalable approaches, um, really trying to combine what traditional ecological knowledge and regenerative agriculture, the bridge that already exists there, really trying to share that with everybody. And so I'm very happy to be here. Um, I got quite a bit of years experience mm -hmm. in the uh, federal side of things in terms of the uh, Department of Interior, um, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, leasing, contracts management, range management, I have a background in agroecology. So just like Olivia said, this is this is really not just the training for me. This is really <clears throat> part of, I guess, my passion of why I do things. So very happy to be here. Thanks, Chance. So well, I like to start with uh, something similar to what Taylor did is just for us to make a group promise. We have some conversations here today. We have our chat. We have some journaling. We have questions. We have breakout groups. So I ask that you all sort of share in this um, moment to recognize that we host you in an open and honest and private sharing space. And we all make the pledge that all the storytelling stays here within this group and that we trust each other enough to get honest, mostly with ourselves and also with each other uh, for these couple of hours uh, without compromises and without consequences. So um, you're welcome to acquiesce and agree to that in the chat, but I assume if they're staying here, you agree with it and, and you're willing to show up. Um, and we're gonna actually start with a breakout group. Um, I think I, I, learned, I learned to lean into the breakout groups, I think from the No Regrets team, for those of you that work with the folks out at Piscinus. Um, and we're gonna split into just couples and just take a couple minutes to introduce ourselves, but we're gonna do it in a little bit of a different way. We're gonna do a land biography. So with your partner, I want you to describe who you are based on, by telling them about the land bases and the landscapes that have affected you and shaped who you are. So not your school and not your work and not even necessarily where you have lived. It could be land that speaks to you and um, you know help, has helped shape your spirit and your heart and you might not have ever lived there. So get creative and um, we're going to break into twos. We're going to take two minutes each person and Taylor and I are going to master the technology to make sure we give you the prompt. Okay, it's a moving target. We got people coming in here. So I think, yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna have one uneven group, but if you get kicked out or- That's fine. Back, I think it'll be you all right. You can always come back into the center room. We'll hang out with you. Sounds good. All right, thanks guys, enjoy. Oh. 
on the roof. Like, I think Nina was the one that got kicked back to us. Hi, Nina. I think you, you can assign her a room, maybe, Taylor. Oh, can I? Great. Okay. Let me just yeah, see if you put in a waiting room. Oh, no, not, I can only put her in a waiting room. See if you can put her in a breakout room. Okay, great. Oops. Nina, sorry. First time doing breakout groups. Move to. Okay, let's try this one. All right, cool. That's really neat. I've actually never done this before. It was more than like a couple people. Um, do you have an option into uh, message the breakouts? Yes. Um, I think I will. Oh, and there's Tiana. Hi, Tiana. Hi, sorry. Oh, but here. Oh, I have the same thing. Going on. No, no worries. I'm going to put you in. Um, let me see if I can put you in. Are you getting a thing to join a breakout group or do I need to put you in one? Mm, I room don't... three is only one person. Oh, okay. Tiana, I'm going to put you in room three. Did you understand the prompt? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, there you go. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's find out. Oh, I'm going to move. I'm going to move to... I found it. I didn't think I could, but I was okay, going to move cool. Lucy somewhere too. All okay. Oh, room 10 is also one. One person. <laughs> I don't understand how this, oh, I think some people just dipped out. Um, I'm going to move them to room nine. Okay. That should be good. Okay, cool. Oh shoot, did they just dip out too? Man, this is funny. This is like a oh, okay, there we go. Move to room nine. So is that is that broadcast? Yeah, broadcast message. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So how do you do that? Oh, they got some more folks. I get I got it. Okay, perfect. Hey guys, if you're just joining us, we um broke out into little breakout groups of two or three. Um, so I might just toss you into one of those groups that prompt is in the chat. It's also shared here. If it makes sense, you can always just uh, just listen. So there you go, Jeremy. Uh, I, uh, I was in a breakout group, but it was uh freezing up and breaking up so bad we didn't really uh didn't oh. really get anywhere but shoot it's okay all right. <laughs> did you feel like you made a meaningful convert no you guys didn't even get to anything uh, no no okay that's okay that's how it is sometimes on zoom <laughs> yeah hey uh can you guys hear me yeah yeah hey Drew, i'm sorry i, I connected on my, to my iphone instead of my laptop uh if you want to do that breakout group you still can if you want to yeah, sounds okay. good. Sure. I'll put you guys into room 10. I keep changing my slides. I can't see Jeremy. Oh, I think because Jeremy must have not joined. Oh, shoot. Okay. And so I think once you say don't join, I don't think we can control him. We can't like make him join. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this is kind of a trip. I think I just sent Dominic to his own room, so he might be having some reflection time. That's okay, we're almost done. Okay, cool. How many groups of three do we have? Uh, we a lot, a lot. Okay, so I'm gonna set up another timer then. Yeah, there's one, two, three, four. Okay, 
perennial grazing, hello. I'm gonna put you into a breakout group for 10. Welcome, welcome. Um, Taylor, can you keep your eye on the chat too? Oh, yes. Just stirring it because this is a hard one for me to manage the chat simultaneously. Yeah, I'll, for sure. I'll get at it and, it and maybe just earmark the question, any questions to come through. I'll, but I'll ask people to hold up till then. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, just because I'm talking so much, that it's kind of hard for me. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely try and keep my eye on it. I try and. Yeah, try it and is hard it, to. Multitask like that. Hey, Alicia and Cecilia, were you guys able to do a breakout group? Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah, you. we did. I just the message came up to switch, and I thought we were supposed to leave and get with another oh. partner. Oh. <laughs> but um, it's we, yeah, we had a good chat. Good. good. Okay. All right. I think we can close our rooms, Taylor. Okay. You got it. Close all rooms. This is powerful. We've never done this before. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everyone. It always takes a minute to get everybody back into the rooms. I think we're all trickling in. Hopefully, you all had lively land conversations with your partners. I don't see Chance back in here yet. I'm gonna wait till he arrives. <laughs> So y'all feel free to drop any highlights of your conversations into the chat if you want to share something that struck you. Um, it could be something about you and your own land biography. It could be something about your partner's land biography, whatever you see uh, fit. And thanks for, thanks for swinging with us here. So we're going to get started on the bulk of our presentation. And today what we're going to be talking about is quadruple bottom line businesses, essentially. So this is how I go about teaching business models. Um, and a conversation in the leadership for me is grounded in learning these concepts about businesses that are really values driven and values forward. Um, so when we think about businesses, oftentimes we think about the bottom line, right? And, and just as a refresher of what that means, that's usually the context of an accounting terminology that is uh, referencing the profit or loss statement, right? The bottom line is the profit at the bottom or loss. And uh, I think it's a, a marker for businesses that have profit as their driving motivation. Somewhere along the line in the 80s, environmentalists uh, decided to extend into management theory this idea of the triple bottom line business, a business that considers the environment and the social bottom lines, 
not just the financial bottom lines. Um, and we refer to this as sometimes businesses that consider people, planet, and profit, right? The three Ps. And then later in management theory came along the quadruple bottom line. This is like a relatively new concept. Um, and it's what we're gonna talk about mostly today. And what it throws in there is a sense of purpose, a sense of individual goal, right? Um, well-being, uh, spiritual or cultural driving force, um, the meaning behind life, right? And when we think about what a sustainable or values-driven business is, to me, we're looking at a quadruple bottom line business, something that considers all four. So another way of thinking about purpose is uh, we can look to Japanese culture, something called ikigai. It's a concept form from two words, iki, which means life or alive, and kai, which is essentially the result. And what ikigai is, is your reason for being. And it's defined more of an, as an intersection, right? The common ground between what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. And that's what this Venn diagram is showing us, right? Ikigai is in the middle is the combination of all of those things, right? So here's another image, a little bit less interesting because it's not rainbow, <laughs> but it has some definition in here, right? So <clears throat> the overlap between what you're good at and what you can be paid for can be considered your profession, right? The overlap of what the world needs and what you can be paid for is also something you could consider your vocation. What you love and what the world needs is your is a mission. And what you love and what you're good at is passion. And in the middle, put it all together and you get ikigai, right? This ultimate purpose. So pursuing your own personal ikigai essentially leads to, to growth and, and mastery. It's challenging. It's, it, it inspires a feeling of autonomy and freedom, but it's also very directed, right? Um, you're directed towards a sense of a belief. Maybe it's a particular cause, maybe it's a particular trade, but it's not just the trade, it's what makes you well. It gives you energy rather than taking it away. Um, it's something that's deep inside of you, right? So to go back to quadruple bottom line businesses, if we think about people, planet, purpose, and profitability, which is in here in this image referred to as prosperity, um, the combination of all those four give us a sustainable business. Looked at another way, we've got these three center points, profit, people, and planet being held together by the purpose, right? Being um, inside of the umbrella of your personal driving force, your ikigai. So we'd love to hear in the chat a little bit about which of these images appeals to you. Which one makes more sense to you? The one where people, planet, purpose, and profit are all sort of on equal level and inside is the sustainable business or the one where our business is really the Venn diagram of profit, people, and planet, but the purpose is holding it all together, right? I'm just, I'm always curious to hear what really applies to, to everyone. So take a minute and let us know what you think about there. And while we're in this sort of silent thinking moment, would love for you to think about a few concepts and words about what you want from your business in terms of people, planet, profit, and purpose, right? What, what are your goals in each of these four? And it's okay if you don't have a business yet. This is sort of your dream space for this future business. And, you know, it's, it's who we invited here, right? For you to think about your existing enterprise or maybe something that you're planning on hopping into. And it could also be um, a program inside of your nonprofit work if you're here as a service provider. Um, it could also be inside of your family. Most of our conversation is being, you know, rooted in your identity as an entrepreneur. But uh, if you had to hold yourself to achieving something in all four of these quadrants, people, planet, profit, and purpose, how would you know, right? What would the sign be um, of your success? 
right? So I'll give you an example. And then you all can just jot something down on a piece of paper, have a notebook at the ready or take notes on your computer. Uh, one goal that I always had in, in, in the beginning of my entrepreneurial adventure was in, in terms of the people that I engaged, um, I wanted to inspire them to love agriculture, right? So if I had to hold myself to achieving that, what would one of my successes be? I could call my success being some of my employees became farmers, um, which they actually did. And so that's kind of one of my high points, high points and successes in my life as the people that came through my my endeavors actually went into agriculture. So that's just an example. Take a minute and jot down what this means to you. You're welcome to put it in the chat too, but you're also welcome to keep it for just yourself. And thanks to those of you that are sharing in the chat. So we're gonna talk a little bit about core values now, which are sort of like the pillars of any values-driven business. What are they? There are, they are unchanging qualities that your organization, your enterprise deems most essential. And they really should manifest in everything that you do, right? And we really uh, encourage you to figure out how they can be fully integrated into all your decisions. They're like your personal beacon and they actually can help you make day-to-day -day choices inside of your business. Um, so ethical leadership is knowing your core values and having the courage to communicate them and to make choices with them as the driving force. Being mindful of the common good and and also being mindful of that interior purpose, right? And following your core values is what provides sort of a consistent perception of what you're doing to target audiences. That's essentially your brand identity. Those are big marketing words that are synonyms here for who you are and what you do and who you're doing it for and with, right? Mm -hmm. And your core values can be considered sort of your creed and your cornerstone for how you develop your business. So as a part of this course, we always give out a core values exercise. I don't like to give homework, but this is a really great, simple, fast, rewarding, beautiful little space to create words and phrases that help drive your business forward that you turn back to over and over and over again as a principle as a manager, as an entrepreneur. Um, so you'll get that tomorrow in our follow-up email. So a little bit more about core values, right? If we're considering these four sort of topic areas, right? People, planet, profit, and purpose, your core values are really seeding, seeding your successes in each of those areas, right? They're defining how you go about it. And they can help you reveal those goals in each of those areas, right? And learning about how to, how to talk about these and how to measure your business in terms of these other forms of capital. You know, we're very used to thinking about capital as profitability, as money-based success. And this idea opens up, this idea of planet profit and purpose opens up the thought that there are other forms of capital like other forms of profit and profitability, not just financial, that you're going to gauge your business on. So what we're encouraging is to really turn the, that goal of financial prosperity on its head and look at it more as a byproduct of achieving all of your other goals. Not that we want to whisk it away, not that we want to de-emphasize it. We have to have money cycling in the system in order for it, your business to stay open. Um, but it can be accompanied by thinking through your successes in other forms of capital, right? What is the social capital? What is the environmental capital? The physical, the spiritual, the natural, the intellectual capital that your business offers to the universe and to yourself, right? 
So if you like this concept and you want to dig a little bit further, there's a beautiful article by Ethan Mullen called Eight Forms of Alternative Capital. And y'all will receive this presentation tomorrow in the follow-up email as well. And all these links are live. Um, so I encourage you all to check that out. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chance for a minute. Oh, uh, definitely. Um, so as we were speaking about um, earlier, um, when we took take a look at what does it look like to have the regenerative agricultural principles um, along with what in my specific sense of things, but when when I speak of, for instance, Lakota culture, um, as a tribal member, this is, can just as easily be translated or moved to any indigenous form of thought, um, whether it's Northern Cheyenne, Arapaho, um, Diné, or whatever have you. Um, certain concepts still remain the same. Our methodologies on how we do things can can vary from one to the other, but the core concepts as, um, or the core values to things as Olivia was talking about um, really remain the same. <clears throat> and so when we look at, um, for example, within Lakota culture and regenerative agricultural principles, um, we really see this intersectionality, I guess, if you will, of what um, my grandpa always taught me that as Lakota people or as any indigenous people will tell you, we believe we're kind of the first ecologists or biologists of the world or scientists, I guess you could say. And so within our mindset of that, we also believe we're the same um, economists, that we make the most absolute amount of use out of the littlest amount possible. And so when we cross that with our ability to work within nature and within our environment in a symbiotic manner, that's really, we see this interse intersectionality of what regenerative ag really is in a modern day sense. And so um, when we look at these things, I mean, really um, the producers, let's say, for example, that I tend to work with in really honing this, what it looks like to both develop um, from a regenerative ag standpoint, but bridging the gaps of what indigenous thought or life ways can bring to the table has really been beneficial across the board. Um, because really, in essence, regenerative ag and um, Lakota thought are really speaking about the same things. And so, like I said, we're trying to really bridge that gap in terms of um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to push forward is we're basically trying to leave things better than we found it. And we're always trying to give back more than we're taking. And so when we think about things um, from that standpoint, um, I think we tend to see, I think it's a phrase that I heard that I always take to heart is that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so when we take a look at any kind of hardships, when we look at drought, when we're looking at any kind of market conditions, when we're looking at our landscape, um, there's a certain level of diversity there that um, um, I think in terms of our enterprise, but also in terms of struggles and I guess adversity from that sense of things really helps to define and really helps to bring forth a lot of our best thought. And so um, I think back to Olivia's point about what core values look like in this area, when we really start to hone and define what those look like for each of our enterprises or each of our operations or each, whatever, what have you, I think that's what really helps give us that purpose um, when it comes to pushing through um, the next level of success or through the current challenges we're currently in. And so um, that we're really taking um, not necessarily control of things, but we're definitely learning how to lean into um, what it looks like to be more consistent across the board. You wanna to go to the next one, Olivia? And so I guess building off of that, uh, we really get into this. Um, we have a few different names for it. And I believe, like I said, it very varies from culture to culture, but really we circle around this thing of seven generations thinking um, and what it means as a Lakota person in our culture. And you're going to hear me reference Lakota a lot just because that's um, specifically to to my skill set and what I bring forth. And so, like I said, these things can just as easily be translatable into other language. but um, from a Lakota perspective, that we tend to look at things seven generations before us and seven generations after us. And so what sort of impacts are we making? And from a leadership standpoint, you really have to look at um, being strategic as possible when it comes to uh, planning for those areas of being able to take into account what happened in the past, but also moving forward, what that looks like on so many different levels. And so, like I said, you really have to take time to be intentional about processing, about 
what sort of plan you're going to be putting forward. And like I said, core values are um, really at the forefront of that and really help to hone and shape that. Um, in our area, what we're trying to do now is something a little newer in terms of terminology, but we refer to it as a long arc strategy um, instead of something that's just more like a three to five year strategic plan. We're looking 100 years down the road, 150 years down the road. What can that look like? And really trying to keep our plans and really trying to be intentional about our planning to help keep it dynamic. I think one thing that I used to see when I was um, in the federal government side of things is that we tend to come up with solutions to last year's problems. I'm sure a lot of you can identify with that, that everything is a really slow moving process. And I think being able to be as accounting for different components, but also dynamic in terms of your decision making. And so I really think um, that goes in a long ways. And so I think when we're applying this these concepts to both a producer, an operation, whatever it is, you really have to be cognizant of not just the financial part of it or the, the animal side of animal health of it, but really of what it is that you're trying to put forward into your community and in forward to um, the market you're going to contribute to, whatever it might be. And so <clears throat> I think when, when I take a look at what Olivia puts forward or what we both put forward with the quadruple bottom line, what really drives it home for me is from an indigenous and Lakota person is that step before soil health, that step before animal health, that step before financial health is what, what that meaningful purpose-driven piece of things look like. Why would I want to be dialing in soil health or animal health, financial health? What is it that, what is my impact going to be and how can I best put that forward? And I, I think that really goes, I think taking the time and the effort and work to really pull that out of you and pull that out of your operation or whatever, however you're structured. I think that's really the most crucial part of this when getting started. And I think that solves so many problems before they even start when you get to that point. So. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, we'll do a little preview here of the next section that we're going to talk about, which what it means to be a leader. So I want you to take a minute in anticipation of that, get out your notebook or pull up the chat box and think about whether you consider yourself a leader or do you consider yourself a manager and why? What makes you a leader or a manager and what's the difference between the two? And if you don't see yourself as a leader, what are the things that you think you would need to have in order to become one? So just take a minute and think about some of those prompts, whatever speaks to you. Drop in the chat if you feel like sharing, but jot some notes down where you can come back to them because we're gonna come back to them in a minute. So now that you've decided what you think it is, we're going to tell you what we think being a leader is. And we're going to kick it off with chance, actually. This is yours. Uh, so, yeah, so like I said, when we come, um, when we look at things um, from my perspective of things and what Olivia and I have kind of cultivated through our journey and, and what leadership tends to look like at us, I think. We tend to look at, um, you see the saying there across the board, a seed planted, a truth, weather all storms. Meaning that when you definitely have those core values, when you definitely have that purpose figured out, and it's always going to be a work in progress, right? It's always going to be um, something that's a constant development, a constant evolution, a constant growth. But when you have your direction, um, in our culture, we like to stay, and I believe it's been said throughout others also, but we say um, strained, not straight that we definitely have that direction of where we're going and how we get there. And so um, when we tend to look at <clears throat> um, what it is in native culture, 
or Lakota culture, it's really in line with what we what you see there in terms of servant leadership, that you exist in your role as a leader to benefit the others who are counting on you. And so when that's when you really look at how true that is when it comes to an operational level thinking or from a business level thinking. And um, my relatives who use the totem pole on the northwest side of things, I think it was a really good teaching moment there that um, for those of you who are unfamiliar that a totem pole people tend to think that, oh, I'm the top of the totem pole, that I'm tend to, um, that I'm I'm above. But really, when it comes to leadership, the totem pole, the most dependent on are actually at the bottom, holding all the rest up. And so when we really look at um, what it is that the abilities as a leader, it's like really the ability to hold those others up around you, to be that rock for everyone else. Um, and so I think... Um, really cultivating the skills and cultivating that sense um, about trying to lead from within about what it looks like to lead, not just from a family perspective, from a community perspective, but also, like I said, when we get into that, um, to the higher levels of what business looks like, what operations look like. And one thing I think is the most important is before we get to these levels, we definitely need to take this personal accounting of and this has always been true in all native cultures, a personal accounting of what your abilities and maybe, um, I guess to not put such a deficit narrative on it, but what maybe your limitations might be to really have that honest conversation of yourself of what um, what you're capable of and maybe what you need to work on, let's say. And so really taking that personal accounting of where you stand in all of those things and really defining what it is and how to put your best foot forward. And I think that's... Um, I think that's really key when it, when we're looking at from a Lakota perspective. And I think what really drives it home, and I, I always heard this um, growing up uh, from my grandfather, from my father, uh, and then it really rung true after they had passed. And I'm sure some of you can identify with this, is that the moment you know you're becoming a man or a woman, whatever it is, is that when you realize that nobody's coming. And I think that like at the bottom there, that really drives it home. And not from necessarily a morbid standpoint, but that, that self-reliant part part of it, that when you definitely have to have things dialed in because at the end of the day, you don't have a safety net, that this is on you. So you really need to take that intentionality and take that to heart of what that looks like from a leadership standpoint, that at the end of the day, you got you. So taking time and putting that effort into what it looks like to um, take that accounting and really... Um, be honest with yourself, have an honest conversation, with those around you of uh, what's, what it means to be a leader. If you want to next slide, Olivia. Yeah. And I think that that really gets back to, well, what does that accounting look like? That accounting looks like doing some good creative thinking work on what's driving you. Like that's that core value um, exercise, right? Um and it can be quiet and it can be silent and it can be every day, but it starts there. So what we're talking about is essentially a sense of courage. It's rooted in vulnerability. It's not rooted in what we perceive as some outward strength. And we're also talking about leadership as something that evolves and leaders that grow into their identity, right? through experience, through self-vision, self-exploration, self-love, self-analysis, and that strengths emerge slowly. They're not there, just kind of sitting there, right? They need to be cultivated. And if we can recognize this idea of vocation and passion in ourselves, and we're on this path to this purpose, this ikigai, right? This, this position, holding up the rest of the totem pole, um, then we realize it's the other people around us that we are inspiring and instilling that same thinking of in that defines us as a leader. If we are affecting those around us, we are in a leadership position. So this quote is from Renee Brown, who is kind of, you know, become a pop culturalist, but in 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 her heart, she's really a researcher, you know, and a sociologist and mm -hmm. So much of her work is rooted in understanding vulnerability. And so she says, anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in other people and processes has the courage to develop that potential, that potential in themselves and that potential in others. And what it takes 
is being uncomfortable, right? So we want to talk a little bit um, more deeply about different theories of leadership. This is kind of, this has been our entree into it. And the main theory that I ascribe to and um, bring to the table in this conversation that Chance and I, through our long dialogues, have discovered is very much in tune with Lakota principles of leadership, which is why we're here together with you today, is a concept called servant leadership that was developed by a dude named Robert Greenleaf. He's just like a corporate white guy at at t in the 70s who writes an essay. And it's based on the characters in Herman Hesse's Journey to the East book. So he starts to dissect these characters, right? Two characters in this book, the servant character and the leader. The servant is sort of the traditional archetype servant, acts with integrity and spirit, builds trust, lifts people up around them. And then we have the leader, already trusted, shapes others' destinies, going out alone, right? And Greenleaf says, what if these two identities are merged into a, a blend of the two, a servant leader? Then leadership could be a long-term transformational way of life and work. Sounds kind of familiar. Sounds like purpose. Sounds like ikigai, right? That has potential for creating positive change in society. And what it says is what Chance was saying. We are here first and foremost to serve other people around us, our organizations, and everything that is a part of them. I have a bit of an allergic reaction to the terminology servant, given our American history of the last 500 years. So I often sort of just do my own conversion of this word to service leadership. That's the, that's the concept behind it, um, because it feels quite odd, I think, to ascribe to anything that promotes a servant identity. So you'll see that I sort of flop between the two words here. So Greenleaf says the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. And that person is sharply different from one who is leader first, perhaps because of the need to assuage an unusual power drive or acquire material possessions. The difference between the two, the leader first and the servant first individual, manifests itself in the care taken by the servant. First, to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. And the best test is, do those served grow as people? So they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, and more likely themselves to be in service to others. So the servant leaders out there focusing on everybody else, and using power and ethically and empowering others rather than just than depending on this de facto use of power, right? A, a servant leader uses power as little as possible. And we can perceive this as soft, right? Because historically in this capitalistic culture that can often be seen as too mushy, right? There's like this prejudice against empathy and listening. I have a sweatshirt that says practice radical empathy that I always try to wear whenever I give this presentation, but I forgot today, but that's really what it's all about, right? Um, it goes against like what we perceive as this like active control taking thing. Um, and it is also, if you'll know in this quote, it's, it's not about just serving others. The test is that those around us that we serve are then inspiring others, right? So it's like a trickle down effect in his theory. So let's think a little bit about what the characteristics of a leader are. Um, these words actually came up at a Kavira coalition workshop at a Regenerate conference years ago when we asked this prompt, what are the attributes of a leader? And we were talking with a bunch of um, Nap apprentices, and this is what they came up with. So, this is you, Chance. Yeah. <clears throat> so, when we look at characteristics of an indigenous leader, um, I think something I seen someone put it in the chat about leadership is a developmental process, and I completely agree. Um, but I think there's also some. Uh, 
precursors to what it looks like to be in that mental process. And I think one thing going back to what I mentioned about this uh, self-accounting, uh, this personal inventory of limits and um, possibilities within a person, I think that really going into that, into this acute self-awareness of being able to have um, one of the most, uh, I guess when I look at overall what things look like um, to definitely have those honest conversations with yourself, but also um, to have that awareness of where your abilities could take you. Um, and I think because of that, when we look at from an indigenous perspective and you see this uh, remnants of it in other organizations also, but there's a sense of not necessarily obligation or duty, but of belonging that at the end of the day, being part of a, a bigger part of the whole, I guess you could say, and there's a certain level of responsibility that always accompanies that. Um, the other part of it is um, the selflessness of being able to look at things in the true service leadership side of things of being able to put others before you. And I think throughout all these, the theme for myself is always looking at integrity of always having those honest, honest conversations from the get go, not just with yourself, but throughout your entire gener throughout your entire evolution and development as a leader. And I think one of the main principles that I see is being able to, when you're crafting a vision of where you want to take, not just your own personal um, operations, uh, leadership, whatever it is, of being able to have that self-talk with yourself. Um, once you start getting familiar with what personal accounting looks like, of what, how to put things into action, of definitely being able to craft visions of that point, of what things can possibly look at. And I think... In our culture, we always have a certain level of ambition um, that tends to really get a bad rap sometimes that it, because it's so self-centered. But um, there needs to be a certain level of ambition and um, willingness to take initiative when it comes to putting plans into action to basically go from vision to action. And I think there's that part is really key when we're looking at it. And I think one of the most important things throughout our leadership journeys um, as Indigenous people is being able to connect the dots within all of these things so we can be as proactive as possible. And I think I always use a good example of, we even looked at what that looks like today in terms of practical sense. Um, a good example is my grandpa doesn't buy snow shovels in the fall going into the winter season. He buys them in the spring when they're on sale. <laughs> so it's like being as proactive as possible. And you, you can apply that to anything of being ahead of the curve as possible when it looks like um, in any kind of operation. Um, definitely looking at those moments where you can put forth the least amount of effort but have the most amount of results and being the most energetically efficient that you can be. Um, and that also comes with being observant, of being able to not just observe your surroundings, um, the community you're part of, your environment, but also your, yourself. What is your self-talk telling you throughout all of these processes, through your ups, through your downs, through any of it? And really being able to make use of that knowledge in the most thoughtful and intentional way of really learning and being introspective about yourself of um, how to put those things into action and how to work on certain things that you might need to work on. And I think the biggest key for a leader um, in our area in, in indigenous thought is being adaptable because the weather is never going to cooperate. The environment's never going to cooperate. You're always on your toes with everything. So being able to be adaptable and dynamic in, in everything. And like I said, these things, don't just apply to what we're talking about now, but have far reaching capabilities when we're looking at business, when we're looking at operational level thinking. I think these things are so key, um, like you said, in, in moving forward as a leader. So building on that, you know, some other characteristics that we think everybody should hold is the ability to listen to oneself and to others and reflect, right? Chance has talked a lot about that. Empathy accompanied by generosity, healing oneself and others. Awareness, you can see the theme here, right? It starts with you and then it spreads outward. Persuasion as a lever of power instead of like positional authority. So instead of just staking your claim and staying there. Conceptualization, dreaming, looking beyond the day to day. Foresight, just connecting those seven generations past to those seven generations future, right? And and stewardship, holding in trust and commitment to the growth of those around you. 
not just to yourself. So what, how do you do all of this? Like what power is all of this? It is really just kind of spirit and faith and hope in the face of an uncertain path. And that's definitely a sign of an entrepreneur, no matter how big or small you are. And this concept that leadership is separate from, but supported by expertise, right? It's not a site up. It's not that like charismatic person that we always think of like, Oh, natural born leader. We want to undo that thinking and recognize that it is in your power and control to grow into this leadership, right? Anyone with any, any personality type can grow into a good leader. Um, and that magnetism that pulls people in can also be abused. So it's not always an awesome trait. It needs to be controlled and honed. Um, it can be a weakness. So let's not depend on this, this predisposition towards leadership and people that you either have or you don't have, but rather cultivate your own leadership. And you can see in this quote here from Robert Greenleaf that there's you know, processes, techniques, knowledge sources that provide that expertise in the field of work, which the leader works. Mastery of those takes time and hard work. The possession of them works when an expert or a critic, but not necessarily a leader. Leadership overarches expertise. So what we've put here is, is, is the commonalities between servant leadership characteristics and indigenous leadership characteristics is that what we give out, not what we get that defines us as leaders and establishes legacy. And we're always going to be giving something up that we want for ourselves in the short term to provide for those around us. And the synergy that we experience when surrendering that self-interest for the greater good is part of what makes us that that leader, right? Chance, you want to talk about this one? <clears throat> so I think um, building off of Olivia's concept of what um, entrepreneur entrepreneurial identity exploration when it comes to um, an indigenous perspective, I think we really tend to look at um, the economic systems that had to exist um, within these societies and our society when it came forward to, like I touched on a little bit earlier about being able to um, take that initiative and have that ambition um, to go out and provide not just for your family and community, but for the, for the, um, for the whole, I guess you could say, when it would come to um, scouting or to um, and any of these aspects of what um, indigeneity, I guess, put forward. I think <clears throat> one thing that we really take to heart um, with, within these concepts of, and I think people are probably wondering what the organs are there for. And I think something that really speaks to me when Olivia and I were talking about this is being able to really be accountable as far as your role in what community or what a business or operation looks like. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, when you're looking at the organization of what things look like, of let's say you take the example of, we all need our heart to pump. We all need our lungs to breathe. We all need our circulatory system to work. We all need our brain to help function, to help regulate all these things. None of these are greater than the other. We can't have one without the other. And so definitely looking at these things within our um, organizations of looking at how operations work, of being able to be cognizant and acknowledge um, different roles, um, not only that you put forward, but the others that you work with or other organizations, others in the operation, of really being cognizant of how each other really mesh well together. And I think just one thing that, um, <clears throat> when, I, when I think of a couple of things when it came to this, um, initially when we we're talking about being able to cultivate that part of yourself, um, of what I think from a indigenous entrepreneurial standpoint, when we look at, um, in a lot of ways, like I said, the selflessness part is definitely key because when we look at cultivating our best self and to us, that is our offering to the world that we look at what is our best self and let's, let's give that person to the world. 
And so I think when we look at this, that really translates well from an entrepreneurial standpoint of being able to um, put your best foot forward um, because that in itself is your contribution. And so, and um, we did throw in some Lakota words and for our lexicon here, just because, like I said, there's words that I'm sure that are in other languages that really speak to these things, but um, for the context that we're speaking about here, I really think um, these things are really um, relevant. And so for those of you who would like to learn some Lakota, you have an opportunity today. Um, otherwise, like I said, this is really complementary to what we're speaking about here. So one of the words that we have is wakishake, and that's a type of resiliency um, when we look at, um, I think one thing that this word here, and we won't get into depth on all the words, but this one is really unique because what wakishake means is when you look at resiliency, a better way to describe that in Lakota is um, it, it really speaks to floating on the water and think about how resilient you have to be to float on the water. And so a lot of these words, um, they're, they're really cool to, like when we get into them, but uh, for the sake of time, we'll, we'll just kind of go well through them a little slower here. But uh, um, in our word, in our culture, we have a word for assertive or ambitiousness, which is um, and being able to not just be direct, but have that constant um, temperance with your directness. And so I think that really is awesome. And another word is wichoableze. Um, it's an understanding or a realization, but it's as a whole. I'm not just you and I'm not just I understanding something, but we as a whole understand this, which it's almost like this coming together of a light bulb to communitively. So it's, I think it's really awesome. Um, and adaptability, which is yulakota. Um, being able to have that sense about yourself of always being self-reliant, of not panicking, but being able to be present in the moment and figuring things out. Um, Waushila, which is a type of compassion, a kindness um, that has to go beyond yourself of being understanding to the needs and circumstances of others. Um, to have this foresight and vision in our culture, we say Ichiksapa, of being able to um, see beyond your current circumstances, not just in the moment what's going on, but seeing solution-based approaches to things. Um, and then the last, humility of being able to make foresight about yourself. Um, and so being able to have those moments of reflection and introspection that allow us to um, really be analytical and critical of ourselves in a healthy manner and being able to be humble um, when we need to be. So. I love the etymology of them, those words. I'm going to build out that slide more, Chance. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we, uh, this, this concept of leading from failure actually came about from working with farmers and ranchers and leading workshops on leadership. Um, and it came out of conversation and understanding how to honor the value of failures. Um, they tend to be more meaningful and more instructive and more profound than whatever we perceive our successes as. And they can be a source of strength. And it really is about a uh, perspective. It is changing your perspective of what happens when you uh, confront hardship and challenge um, and failure, which is a quite judgmental word, right? If we, if we change our outlook on what those actually can give us and gift us, um, and we can use a creative approach to reconsider them as positive moments. Um, they really turn into fissures. They sort of, they're the avenues to transformational change. And we can't really move forward well if we don't have moments of failure because we would be naive. We wouldn't even know what we were doing that was working. We would be unprepared. We would be inexperienced in our complexities. Chance, you want to tell us about failing forward faster with that concept of that? Absolutely. Um, so my grandpa, um, very experienced, seasoned individual, um, would always um, use teachable moments to tell us about, in, in whether it's ranching or agriculture or just in life, about how he's obviously failed more than he succeeded. And I think you see that's a common theme with anybody who's successful, is that you tend to fail more 
um, then you are successful. Um, but there's an upward trend to it, right? And so he was saying that's where learning happens. And so when he would say, if we're going to fail, fail forward. And then he said, when you get to the habit of being able to fail forward, fail forward faster. And so I think that's a really recurring theme within our culture of being able to really develop that skill set of failing forward faster. Um, and like how Olivia was talking about these fissures or these um, areas, just a really quick notion is that we also have this sense of self-induced adversity um, in a lot of indigenous cultures of what self-induced adversity, whether it's an early wake up time, whether it's a type of um, unnecessary stress we put on ourselves, but it's to really help us fail forward faster is that that's where growth happens. That's where transformation takes place. And so really being able to construct that for ourselves in the most meaningful way. And so, like I said, I always love that. And it's something I'd still use to this day is being able to fail forward faster. So one thing I like to encourage people to do is actually like document your failures, right? Um, it's easy to forget what happens. We, it's a survival mechanism. We often want to forget these failures and we have revisionist history about those challenges, right? I mean, childbirth is the, the one that comes to mind for me <laughs> immediately. Um, but I encourage you all to, to really actually journal a bit about your journey through those failures and learn from them in the future. And this is absolutely, looking at them as an instrument of improvement is absolutely a key leadership tactic. Um, and another aspect of learning from these failures is sharing them. So bringing your community into your failures and your challenges and pushing out the tendency to put our best face forward and sugarcoat what's happening to us in small talk and not inviting in, especially in farming and ranching communities, not inviting in that vulnerability. Um, the vulnerability we've learned is what makes you a leader. Speak about those failures in public. Um, there's really you know, no room for pride here. Telling your story is going to get you uh, to value them. So we're gonna take a little moment and do another breakout group in pairs and threes. And I want you to think about these concepts that we presented and reflect on your identity as an entrepreneur, whether that's in the present moment or the future moment, and call out a couple of reflections that this dialogue has inspired in you and share it with your breakout group. Um, and I wanna know whether it has changed your thought process about what a leader is or what a manager is and, um, and think about what you might want to actually discover, develop, explore inside of your identity as an entrepreneur. Um, which concepts that we talked about resonate, like what stands out or what seems hard and confusing, what's like not very convincing. So I will copy this and drop it into the broadcast so you can ruminate on this. And we'll take, um, we'll take more than two minutes. We'll take like three minutes to each person here. Um, so Taylor, you can uh, drop us in. Okay, I'll just assume that if you're here, you weren't totally in the mood to go to a breakout room, which is totally fine. If you do want to go to a breakout room, just let me know. I can toss you into one.
looks like we got room five is just a solo person, Taylor, and then move them. You're gonna move them? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll move them. Hi. Hey. I was hi. I was I was in a breakout room by myself. I'm sorry about that. I'm not the greatest at breakout rooms. That's okay. That's <laughs> let okay. Me, let me toss you into another. No, all good. I tried to drop you in another one, but I think you probably exited right as I was trying to put you in. <laughs> That's probably what happened for sure. Okay, let's see. Okay. You are Cecilia. Do, do, do. I'm gonna move you to. Let's move you to room two. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sorry. That's okay. Uh oh, still alone. <laughs> what the heck? Let's see. Okay, let's see. Oh, you're right. Try that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's weird. There's some folks that keep dropping. Yeah, I think it's like a funny thing. Like you have to. It's like a moving target. You know, you're just like. Things are kind of dropping and adding. Yeah. For next time, is there a way for me to like take you out of the? Because I think that's also funky is that I keep putting you into breakout groups, which I should. Makes it so that somebody gets on their own, I think. Well, I mean, it, the number of people is always changing. So, yeah. you know, people drop in and out. It's not, it's not about whether we join or not, you know. Okay. It just always takes a little bit of management, I think. You can oh, also, okay. like, pre-assign groups, but that's just more work on the back end. Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to tell you, Olivia, I don't know if it's your earbuds or if it's uh, just Wi-Fi, but there is some, like, fuzziness but it it like comes and goes so there's like it'll be fine and then it'll drop into like sort of a fuzzy audio i'm not sure if oh interesting that. i heard that on chance too did you experience it with chance as well or just me oh weird no i didn't hear what chance okay well let me switch to my earphones and How's that? Is that different? Oh yeah, that's great. Oh, weird. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Next no time you can just chat me in the middle. I know. I didn't want to like throw you off. Um, but okay. it really you wasn't. Want throw me off. Okay. It wasn't too bad. Um, it was definitely like everything was understandable. I think it'll just be like optimal. If, yeah. Now that you got new okay. headphones. Okay. Cool.
Okay, I think we can start to bring folks back. Okay, I think I'll close the rooms. Okay, 60 seconds. Oops. All right, I'm gonna wait for everybody to trickle in here from the rooms. Hopefully you guys had some good conversations with your groups and some good reflections, shared reflections. Um, so now we've got a little bit of the nuts and bolts side of things, not terribly nuts and bolts, but mm, a little bit more on how we're supposed to do all of this. We're going to breeze through this so that we can have some time for Q&A at the end as well. So A pretty common way of formulating our observations about how we dedicate our time inside of our businesses is the idea of what is working on the business, what is working in the business, and what is working on ourself, right? <clears throat> We're not working on ourselves. We can't achieve that famous purpose that we've been talking about for an hour and a half. So if you have to well, first let's define it. Working in the business is like the day-to-day -day actual core activities of your business, right? Production, sales, a little bit of the back end that goes into both of those things. But, you know, in this audience, we're talking about farming and ranching and getting our products out onto the street. Working on the business, we often perceive as not as pressing, right? It's the stuff that gets to the bottom of the task list. Um, it's often overlooked, but it's absolutely necessary, and I would often say more necessary, um, in order to efficiently do the work of the business, to work in the business, you got to be working on it. So this is organizational systems, operations, all the back-end processes, analysis, marketing, stakeholder engagement, community involvement, <laughs> excuse me, um, and it's just equally as important as the day-to-day -day work, and even maybe more important is working on yourself as a leader learning, professional development, farm and ranch visits, like seeing what people are doing around you, having conversations with colleagues. So if we go back to this other slide, and if you had to take a guess at how much of a percentage of your time in any given week is working in the business versus how much is working on the business and how much is working on yourself, I would love to have you drop in the chat and see um, where you feel like you're currently spending your time. And this conversation is about wanting to shift some of that time to working on the business. Now, I know that some of you are going to say, well, that total needs to be like 200%. <laughs> and it probably does. <laughs> so you can have a total of 200% if you want to, but just know that if your total is 200%, you're probably not working on yourself very much. Um, so... Chance and I have put together some tips about how to actually shift the emphasis from just working in the business and um, and really carving out time to working on the business um, <clears throat> and on yourself, right? So, and everybody loves to ask the question, well, what do you recommend? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? So if we have to give you a hard answer, I would say in small farming and ranching businesses, small to medium scale, I mean, this is really low. Two hours working on the business in a week is not going to get you that far in terms of like true health and vitality of your business. 
but it's something, it's a start, right? And then if we're looking at every six months, being able to take a half a day to get creative and do big picture thinking and planning, that will change the world of where your business is able to go remarkably just by carving out that time. Um, Chance, you want to talk about these next two since these are yours? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we look at creating a morning practice of so being able to, um, for myself, like I said, in a Lakota perspective, we tend to do self-induced ad adversity. And so how many people like to wake up early? Very few. Um, but I think that also leads to a certain level from a mor morning practice of creating that um, doesn't have to be extreme, but just a familiarity with a certain level of discipline. And so, like I said, you hear a lot of times discipline is being able to do things you don't necessarily like, you maybe even sometimes hate, but doing it, being able to do them in a way that you look like you love them. And so really being able to take these moments and take these this intentionality of, like I said, it could be an evening practice for some of you, but for uh, myself and people that I've worked with in the past, creating a morning practice of being able to get your day started um, similarly, similarly every single day so you have a certain level of continuity that's really grounding, but also allows for this, for business to get done. Um, and then just one quick comment also about working in the business, working on the business um, concept you hear bounced around from other orgs and sessions. Um, I think when you look at working in the business as opposed to working on the business, it's a difference between a $10 an hour job or do you want to do the $100, $100 an hour job? So really there's some components there to look at. Um, and then the other one myself is for work splits, being able to do like a 60 minute, 40 minute, 20 minute work split um but being able to um the 20 minute being able to focus more on physical activity uh so for myself we'll do like a 60 minute just hard meeting whatever it is um 40 minutes of catching up on admin task emails if it's on the ranch whatever it is doing that and then and these can be adjusted to however uh, but being able to just have that balance of being able to go for a walk or walk up and down the, the alleyways whatever it is being able to just constantly recenter yourself and get yourself back to where you need to be um, so the work splits can work out however you need them to, but just being able to have that structure and that flexibility to help ground you throughout the day um, to just give you that that boost of energy and just like I said, continuity at the end of the day. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, mine tends to look like an hour and a half of dumb admin tasks. I get it out of the way. And then I then I do like two hours of creative thinking work, and then I take a half hour to an hour like physical break in the after that sort of morning session. And there's something really to be said for the morning productivity as well. Like that is your more creative thinking time. So if you can carve out like chance does, but I can't do yet, but someday I'll be able to be like chance, <laughs> like a morning practice that is really for yourself. That's, that's working on you and then get into the meat of your work and not, not sacrificing that morning time. Um, because it is sort of like in terms of brain science, when you have your much, your synapses are firing in a totally different way. And I recognize that goes against also, you know, morning animal chores. So it's a balance, right? <clears throat> but it's just about thinking about how to divide up your time instead of just letting the time control you. Um, and in terms of working on the business, you know, really we're talking about creative moments, talking about being able to be analytical. And, um, and that's a different brain exercise than admin stuff, or the the day to day tasks of farming and ranching, you know, and that doesn't happen unless you schedule it. And so when we're looking at these three or four hours every six months, really, what I want you to be doing is doing that quarterly. Um, and when we're looking at something like this next bullet point, like annual strategic planning and budgeting, and another thing that I love to facilitate and teach is strategic visioning. And for those of you that are interested in some practices on that, just get in touch with me. I would love to share my tools with you, but it doesn't have to be formal. Um, I like to think of it as like a personal retreat. And I tend to be on a biannual cycle personally, like a, every two years, but I really suggest for folks that are just starting out to make time every year. And you can like think about it like a vacation. And I know that means planning, but, but it, and it means like babysitters and other people taking care of animals, but it is just, I cannot stress it enough how much, 
how important it is for the longevity and health of your business to be able to isolate time for strategic planning. There's a reason that every organization and corporate business does this. Your little farm and ranch business needs this too. And you can make it beautiful and fun and surround yourself with um, an incredible environment and good food and get creative. Uh, and then check in with yourself. Whatever it is that you dream up in those creative moments, you want to be looking at that on a quarterly basis. Um, if you make your beautiful maps and drawings and dreams and stick them on a piece of paper and then file them away into a drawer, they they probably won't have as much effect if you pull them out and read them every once in a while. Hey, Olivia. So, we have a, yeah. Real quick, we have a question in the chat that says, uh, would planning and creating advertising be considered working in or on? Oh, that's a great question. We kind of throw marketing, depends on what you do, right? Depends on what your business actually does. Um, I would like for you to think of it as working in your business, but for most farmers and ranchers, it's more like working on the business. Um, it is something that we do want to see kind of in our daily tasks. If you are selling a product, it's important that that marketing becomes part of your, your really daily and weekly ritual. <clears throat> Especially if we're talking about, you know, meat here. Um, if it's not, if it's something that is, you're working towards becoming more of a, of a bigger piece of your quotidian business life and you know you need to get there, then you can consider it working on the business. And what we really just want you to be doing is isolating that time, you know, on a weekly basis. That makes sense. So I know that's a little bit of a wishy-washy answer, but it sort of sits at the interim of, or at the boundary of both. But thanks for calling that question out, Taylor. Um, so how do I do this? Uh, it's, you do this with a calendar and with a a to-do list. And I know these sound like silly things to take up your time talking about, but it is a remarkable, there's a remarkable lack of these exercises in most of the businesses I come across and they solve an enormous amount of problems, literally just making the time and space to institute a calendar situation and a task list situation. Um, so you can do this however you're comfortable. It can be digital, it can be analog, it can be on the wall, it can be in an app, in a, on a tablet, whatever is comfortable for you. But the important thing is that you're making deadlines for certain things and you're moving them around, but you're not forgetting them. And you're engaging with um, the sort of bigger picture of all that's on your plate. And, and then we encourage you to track that time. Again, um, the best route towards time management is understanding how long it actually takes you personally to do something. And that's different for anybody. And so how are you going to know? You can guess, but I can guarantee you, unless you track your time doing things, you're not going to really know. And what affords you the ability to better manage your time is having a better sense of how long things take you. And that comes from writing it down. Again, can be a little notebook in your back pocket. It can be um, on an app, on your phone. It can be in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and, you know, if folks that are growing 200 different varieties of vegetables can track all of their labor every day and all of their team's labor, like I work with a lot of row crop farmers that actually can do that, then you guys can do it too. Um, there's a couple of links in here for some other time management Ta uh, tips and, and practices and some theories about time management. So I encourage you to look up those two links when you get our, um, our presentation. And one of the best tools about scheduling and calendaring is actually planning for the unplanned, right? So observing how much time it actually takes to work with the unexpected is it, the same discipline can be applied. And this is in here because I started doing this in my first business. I started tracking the amount of time that it took for me to deal with the complete shit show, whatever the shit show of the day was that came up. And it's amazing what happens when you realize how many hours a week you actually spend doing things that are unexpected and you can start to plan for it. So it 
creates less stress for you. So, you know, if you observe a week over week that roughly like three to four hours of your time ends up with, you know, the unforeseen issues of irrigation and animals and customers and, you know, government agencies or random audits, um, schedule those to those three to four hours in your time, in your brain, like know that that's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen in any given week, great. You just afforded yourself extra time to do something um, in the business and for yourself. So some other tools to execution, right? We've been talking a lot about these values and these visions, like Putting words on them is meaningful and putting those words out there into the world. Again, you're going to get an exercise to do that. And I encourage you all to share that with your team and your stakeholders and your partners and your romantic partners, even if they're not working in the business with you. And that actually helps in ensuring that you're going to be able to walk that walk every day, right? Um, it's about following through on these things and giving yourself tools in order to do that. We give service, we're giving service to staff, volunteers, partners, vendors, everybody. That's the main tenet of these theories of leadership, right, is, is service. And so that actually plays out on a day-to-day -day basis with everyone around you, being professional, not holding grudges, saying thank you, showing appreciation, creating positive energy in your environment, right? And because the theory is, is that those frontline people are never going to perform any different than how you as their leader performs, right? We know that in parenting, but we need to apply it to business as well. Learning and teaching, taking time to learn each week and taking time to teach each month and engaging those around you in those practices. Um, rather, and having the people that you employ actually have opportunities to teach as well. Create clear expectations. So we could have a whole conversation about communication skills and team building, but at, we wanted to mention it at least here, you know, um, creating expectations and two-way communication pathways is critical to expressing your leadership. And the questions you can ask yourself are, if those around you know what they're what is expected of them and do they have their tools to do the work and do they have an opportunity to do its best so finding ways to to communicate constructive criticism in a safe forum is fundamental so those forums um those forums sorry guys somebody's lost in my office building those forums <laughs> Those forums are, you know, meeting times like that are really about uh, receiving information and not just giving it. Acceptance and adaptation. We've talked a lot about that today, right? You're not in control of very much. And this is sort of counterintuitive to what we think about as a leader. And Chance already said it today, you know, surrender to a total lack of control. And I love this quote from one of my... Um, one of my favorite heroes in leadership management writing and theory is a man named Ari Weinzweig, and he runs a series of companies and businesses that is referenced throughout this presentation, and his books are referenced at the end in a resources slide as well. And I encourage you all to reach out and check out their resources. It's at the Zingerman's Family of Businesses. And Ari Weinstein says, recognize that as much as we love control and as much as we believe that being a leader means being in control, most of the time being a leader means being comfortable when you are out of control. And the only thing you can count on is that in small business, you have no idea what the world will be throwing at you. So this couldn't be any more true for all of you in agriculture as well, as I know you have already experienced. And so we just embrace it and we just go into it, right? Don't give up on your goal of improvement. Don't expect to achieve your vision of success and then just rest on your laurels, right? We're going to be continuously investing money and energy and time and um, a lot of time in self-improvement and learning and fostering new ideas because otherwise we will get bored and that will produce bad results. 
And lastly, just believe that you can actually do the impossible. If you don't have that faith, you you can't really get very far uh, as a leader. And that's what we're here to cultivate in all of you, right? And it is what other people don't do oftentimes. It's going that extra mile. And that's how you will be setting yourself apart in business and finding the inspiration, that purpose, that sense of self in order to push you forward. So with that, these are our list of resources that are referenced um, in this presentation. And again, I really encourage you all to investigate some of these a little bit more. And as a follow-up to this presentation, that sort of concludes our main piece. But next week, we'll be offering an hour and a half to hang out with Chance and I and talk about this stuff. So it's a week away. It's not a terribly long amount of time to marinate on some of these ideas, but we would love to be in conversation with you about them. We have room for five of you who have been in this presentation today to come and join us in an office hour session. We're not going to present anything. We're not going to dump more information on you. We're going to listen. And so um, Taylor will be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow with a prompt to email me telling me that you would like to be a part of that conversation next week. And the first five people that email me will be in our office hours. Um, not to make it too much like a gauntlet, but we do really want an intimate group where everybody can bring their bring their experiences, bring their doubts and their fears, um, bring their questions to the table and learn from each other, not just from Chance and I. So look out for that email tomorrow from Taylor, and then you're going to be getting in touch with me um, to secure your spot. And we'll be doing either individual technical assistance or office hours for almost all of these webinars that we'll be doing this year. So it's just a little bit more time to hang out together. Um, so with that, I wanted to give us some time for Q&A and hear your thoughts and take a few, we have, you know, 20 minutes on the books to hear from you all. So I'm going to stop my screen. Oh, before I do that, though, these are email addresses and I'll drop them in the chat as well um, as we're chatting here in Q&A. But thanks for listening and tell us what you think. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was awesome. And Chance, truly, um, just thank you both for your time. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, if anyone wants to jump off mute, you're welcome to. You could also raise your hand using the reactions uh, little thing in that bottom tab. You could also drop it in the chat and I can ask it for you. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for, to those of you who have to take off. There's my email. And I'm gonna do chances in here too. And uh, we definitely encourage y'all to just get in touch with us individually too. We like hearing from you. Hey Olivia, I, I might just kick it off with a question that I thought of in the yeah, last couple that'd slides. that'd be great. Um, yeah, I'm kind of wondering like for folks that aren't in the leadership role quite yet, um, and they're learning to work with a leader above them, sort of how do you, mm. get, how do you get the leader above you to, to practice these things? Or how do you implement this sort of culture within your organization when you're not the leader? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question, Taylor. I love it. Um, so it sort of gets to those beginning basic theories of servant leadership you know, in my book, and then I'll, and I'll pass it off to chance after, after I give my thoughts, right? All we can really do is lead by example. So you have people around you that you can be in service to and showing that your approach to absolutely any part of your role that has accountability and responsibility does so with all of these theories behind it, with all of this spirit behind it, putting other folks first, first, right? And putting the well-being of the entity, the holistic whole around you that you're participating in first is I think the most powerful action 
you can take. You can always give good, honest, open, constructive feedback to your leadership. And I encourage you to have the courage. I encourage you to have the courage to do that. Again, it needs to be in a safe space where that's the only thing that you're doing, where you have you call for an individual moment, an exchange that's private, that's calm, that's not in the moment of stress, that is not as a reaction to something that has happened and offer that feedback. And you can set it up also by, um, you know, documenting it in writing form and say, I'd like to have a meeting about this certain situation, craft your thoughts, and then go into that conversation in person, in voice, with the courage that what your reflection and thinking is, is valuable, right? Um, and never falling into the trap of sort of of, of the inertia of, well, if the atmosphere is toxic, then I can just go along with it, right? And knowing that it is your job, if you do want to develop yourself as a leader to exemplify these characteristics, right? Always in everything that you do. Chance, you want to add anything to that? I would say building off of um, exemplifying uh, a lot of these characteristics, I think, in your sphere, uh, whatever that might look like in your place of work, operation, whatever it is, I think really leading by example and showing what these things look like put into practice and the potentiality that's there, um, not just as far as your role goes, but as far as your role goes, if you were given um, more responsibility or more um, of a leadership type role of what that could look like. And I think really spelling that out um, as someone who's in a leadership role, I think being able to see those who are taking initiative, but also being able to take you aside and be able to show you um, not just, I guess, so much a body of work, but being able to show um, through action of what has been done and what will continue to be. And I think that's really goes a long way in terms of a, a leadership or supervisor, whatever it might be. I think being able to just demonstrate that on um, a scale, I think is really helpful. So, um, I wanna ask um, Lisha, your comment that it feels especially topical. This feels especially topical when working with family. What do you mean by the word topical? Um, well, I mean, it's topical for me specifically because you're talking about um, having a certain having certain values in your own leadership and how you implement that. And then working with a family member or significant other who doesn't share the same maybe don't share it's not that they don't share the same values, but don't go about things the same way. Someone mm -hmm. might have a heavier hand or um, someone may not, doesn't seem necessarily like they learn from their mistakes. <laughs> so having to work. And I think that this is pretty universal with farming is it tends to be a family business or husband and wives. In my case, it's my husband and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law to a certain extent. Um, but it it's, when we have different personality types too, like I'm a very A type, very well organized person. And I like things to be real structured. And I'm working with people who <laughs> tend to, to work well. And like, they have more of a chaotic um, yeah. way of doing things. So trying to like align together and, and put those pieces together has been a real challenge for me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. And, you know, I end up in a lot of situations with a lot of family farm dynamics, including my own. And I can encourage two avenues. One is starting with that core values exercise and getting everybody on the same table there. And it won't always work, but it's a really fast and easy entry point so that everybody's operating from the same source motivation, right? And you do that exercise, each of you individually, and then you come to the table and combine them and you have to, you know, work together to decide on three to five core values that are the driving force of the business. And it's remarkable what happens once you articulate them. It actually does make certain day-to-day -day decisions easier 
because you put them up against that core value and you might go a different direction than you would have if you hadn't all agreed on a specific set of prioritized values, right? That's one easy starting point. That's not going to change your working style and theirs being different. That's about adaptation and delegation. So delegation is really key and in, in family businesses alongside roles and responsibilities defined to each other, just like you would in, in a regular operation. It's something that family businesses often skip is actually creating their job descriptions. And so you each write your own job descriptions and write all the things that you do and the things that you don't do <clears throat> or don't want to do and have a conversation about those, right? And check in on those on a year-to-year -year basis because our rules are fluid and jobs change and enterprises change and operations grow and shrink and check in with each other at the, you know, at the outset of every year and say, okay, is this what I'm still doing? Is this what you're still doing? Are we, are we okay with that? And then giving audience to somebody saying like, look, I really can't handle this aspect of my job anymore. It's just bringing me down. I don't like it. Can we come together somehow and figure out how to pass it off to somebody else, you know? So those are just, it's not going to change character types, but it will help you formalize routes towards actually doing business within families. Okay. Do you find I think idea of let, me know. let me know. <laughs> <God. Okay. laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like too, there's like structures are really nice to get into place, like having that meeting and like making that time, but also, Olivia, do you find that like having a third party too is pretty critical or do you feel like people can get this done on their own between family members? It really depends on the family. I mean, I'm often that person and it really does help because it's an objective voice, but that doesn't work for everybody, right? I've also been proposed as a mediator or facilitator and had family members say, why would we, like, I don't want an outside voice. I don't want somebody else's voice. We already have three, four, five, six family voices. Why do we want somebody else's voice? You know, so um, it can be helpful, but I do think that families with a little bit of intention and some structures can do it themselves. You know, and those structures are things that we already talked about here, like time management tools and shared tasks, um, task management tools and project management tools and a weekly meeting. I mean, things as simple as literally a weekly meeting um, change lives inside of family businesses. Well, any businesses, but. I also just want to get oh, yeah, quick also. Um, I think even based off of what we've already spoke about in terms of um, my family also having a ranching operation of really being able to clearly define like how we spoke about here, your purpose as an operation of what does that look like? And so when you're creating a position description or any of those things, those will all be stemmed from your vision or mission statement as a business. Um, Cause in my experience, I mean, people will only take you as serious as you take yourself. And so really being able to give your, uh, and I don't mean to tend to speak about structure in terms of rigid, but it just gives you that place to grow from, of being able to say, this is what our operation is about. This is what pushes us forward, because that will give you um, the direction of where you're headed. And so, like I said, when you're having these, these discussions, it really helps clearly define where all these roles go. And so, like I said, I've, I've always found that enormously helpful. I'm not just personally, but with other places that I've worked with. So. Thanks, Hans. Other thoughts? Thanks for your thoughts there, Donnie. I like that. Yeah, um, Kenny, if you want to say any more about that, you uh, feel free. Yeah, hey guys, I uh, 
my wife and I were actually having this conversation this morning and, and we just kind of bounce leadership ideas off of each other all the time because of our positions in life. And um, we're kind of our sounding board, you know, and we've made ourselves vulnerable to one another to, to say things like, you know, like, I know, I think I know what your, what your, your target effect was, <clears throat> but I think um, maybe it had this side effect you weren't expecting, you know, with yeah. your people or, um, and then I always use the example of, I, I had a guy in my past that I kind of came up with, uh, in my career and he ended up moving into a higher leadership position than I had earlier. And when he got there, uh, it, it seemed like his persona completely changed and he didn't want to hear that he didn't have the tools to be the leader that he was charged with being. And so mm -hmm. Uh, it became kind of this feeling that um, if you close that door on feedback from your subordinates, you never have to hear it. So if you're uncomfortable mm -hmm. with hearing it, you can go ahead and close that door and keep people from sharing um, your weaknesses with you so that you can improve. So um, mm -hmm. it, it, it really speaks to like, knowing who you are, being comfortable with taking criticism. Um, but I also think that like allowing people and your and family members, especially like um, it's harder for me to take criticism from the family than anybody, I think. But the more you do it, the more, just the easier it becomes to hear it and the more you act on it. You know, and that's the other piece of that. Like it's no good if you've opened that door and yet don't, do anything to improve yourself or, or don't, don't ask for input on how, you know, anybody coming to you with a problem or telling you you have a weakness should also maybe be available to offer advice and vice versa. Like, so that's just, that's, that's just a little, that's about one cent, not two cents. <laughs> Good thoughts, Johnny. I like it. Thanks. Thank you for saying that, Donnie, and I appreciate that you and your wife are working together. My husband and I work together, and I think that that is a difficult thing for family operations to be able to, and I think it's important to be able to say, I disagree with your idea or the way we are operating in such a manner, and then be able to have a really meaningful, hard discussion about it and move forward with it. Um, it, it's good to see other ranching people working on that. You know, segregating spaces for this conversation is really interesting too. That's one of the things that I sometimes suggest for families is like not allowing yourself to trip into the conversations at the dinner table or at 10 o'clock at night, like getting ready yes. for bed. And uh, right. it's like, sounds super basic. It's like, wait, but I have children and I'm, <laughs> farming and I'm ranching and I have my off farm job and then I got my side hustle and my hobby and my children. It's like, well, that's when it is to talk. It's like, well, no, that's a choice. That's a choice you make. And if you were in a job, you wouldn't have the opportunity to have the conversation while you're getting undressed in the closet. Like you would have to have a meeting and your family business needs that meeting too. Yes. And, um, and so designating actual business spaces for conversations is a discipline that's real hard for family farming business, but it's super, super fundamental. And like, again, it's like on the schedule and it looks and feels different than dinner. Um, I love this. My grandmother thought never make any important decisions after 7 p.m. My husband, I'm also engaged in a family farming operation and my husband doesn't ever want to talk about anything after in the night 
So I have the automatic, like I can't talk about anything in the night and it drives me crazy because of all the things that I just said, which is like, wait a minute, like I'm doing all the other things all day. Like it's the night. That's when we're going to talk about the things. And he's like, it's off limits. I can't talk about these things at night. And so he'll be like at 9 a.m. Like, so do you have like 45 minutes right now? I'm like, no, it's not scheduled. Like schedule it. And so if you put it on the schedule, we're going to have the like meeting. And so now we have meetings, you know, and um, it's, it's, it, yeah, it gets back to meetings and lists. It's all about meetings and lists at the end of the day. It's like really basic. You don't need to listen to Chance and I for two hours if you just make more lists and more meetings, probably. <laughs> so. And Olivia, I, I know this is kind of a big question for having one minute technically left, but I actually think this is kind of something that m many people will find relevant is when I ran a business, I felt like I was so burnt out that the, like the concept of like serving was like, I, my cup was not full. So I felt like I couldn't mm. even like the concept of, like, I felt like I was getting really short with customers, even when I'm like, what am I doing? Those are my, that's like the lifeblood of this thing. Why am I? But I just felt like maybe I was just too burnt out. So can you talk a little bit more about like, getting to the place where you feel like you have enough to be in service of the people mm. who work for you and your customers? Well, that's about working on yourself, right? Mm. So if there's no time that's made as part of the working order of the business for you to be nourishing yourself as part of your business job, right? Whether that be learning or whether that be doing an aspect of the business that you love, like say, you know, you, you love doing this part of production, but you're taking off it because it makes more sense for your husband to do it or this employee to do it. But then the joy is gone, right? Then that's part of working on yourself too, right? And saying, okay, this is not the most efficient choice for my business, but it's the piece that if I like, if being a part of whatever it's going to be, farrowing or lambing or riding horses on the weekend. Like if, if that is also something that has to happen in the business and it brings you joy, but you've cut it out for other things, find a route to put those pieces back in and consider that part of your job. Cause that's that, you know, percentage that we just said is part of your job is working on you. And once that working on you part expands a little bit, it will feed the energy that you have to be in service to others, I, I think, you know, and, and, and Cole actually talks about this. Cole is a shepherd who was on this call earlier and had to dip off. But one of the things, and I work often with her and one of the things that, and she and I will be teaching actually in the fall. So come back and hear us talk about things. But she, one of the things that she talks about, it's actually a core value of um, the organization that she also runs is, is a, alongside her contract grazing business is something called a culture of care. And everything gets back to her in her mind when she gets burned out and when she gets overwhelmed, it's like we're building a culture of care. So what does that look like in how people's daily schedules are built? What does it look like in terms of how contracts are actually lined up? If there's not the culture of care, then the contracts are back to back. Shepherds are working 24 hour shifts. And that's, and then we are just perpetuating this thing of this industry. It's just the way it is. But having isolated that as like a key core value to her business means that the actual systems of things like schedules, like looks different. Is it financially viable? She's got to work to, to ensure that as well. But the schedules are not out the window because the culture of care is identified as a driving factor. And that allows people the space to feel healthy, which is then where you have essentially, I think enough energy to know that you can be in service, right? You can do both. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I do think it's really about space for yourself. Chance, I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that. No, I think definitely you nailed that one as far as anything I could <laughs> add, so. It's pretty good. Taylor, I think it's also reverting it from the bottom to the top, right? The whole our whole presentation is about that it is service first, right? It's not the thing you add on. 
it it is your whole thing actually and if you set out in your operation knowing that that is what you're doing it's not an add on or it's not something that you like have energy for on a good day then it changes right yeah that's super helpful thank you Um, I think since folks are hanging out, we have one more question. Um, otherwise, we can wrap up. Sorry yeah. for hog and things, but. Uh. <laughs> no, really good questions, Taylor. I appreciate Thanks. the prompts. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Awesome. Well, if well thanks, Al. Yeah, feel free to email Olivia or, or Chance or, or myself and we'll follow up with an email tomorrow where you can get all the nice resources and be able to use this information going forward. So thank you so much to our speakers. Can't yeah, tell you how you valuable all. this was. And thank you. And please everybody. give us feedback. We'd love to hear about how we can make this better and what resonated, what didn't resonate, like what was weird. Um, you know, please feel free. <laughs> Sounds good. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks to Kavira for hosting us. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.